Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Pytel. Today's topic of discussion is basic electrical quantities. Our objective is to introduce the basic electrical quantities of voltage, current, resistance, and power. We'll discuss the units, common instrumentation used to measure these properties, and the means of calculating these quantities. Right up front, I want to clarify the title of this lecture, Basic Electrical Quantities. Realize we'll discuss the basic electrical quantities basically. I do not wish to get into unnecessary technical detail at this point. However, I do want to give you a worthy preview of common concepts that we will deal with over and over throughout the course of the basic electronics series. As such, I will make broad sweeping generalizations, wholly inaccurate simplifications, nebulous analogies, and use comical contrived examples. I want this lecture to serve as a quick peek inside Pandora's box before we smash the box open and a fire-breathing, bat-winged, thousand-tentacled monster explodes out of it. As we delve deeper into this lecture series, I plan to show you more and more of this monster, a tentacle at a time when it is appropriate to do so. I do not wish your brain to explode in sheer horror. Yet. The time will come when you are ready to face the horror full on, but first you must sharpen your wits, learn a couple basic block check strike combinations, and show up to class and lab every day prepared to train for battle. As much as I'm denigrating the contents of this lecture as basic and contrived, I'm embarrassed to admit I use this stuff all the time. Yes. I know all the details about the chemical reactions internal to a lead acid battery. I know about Lewis definitions of acids and bases, and I know all about the subatomic detail of electron orbitals. But when it comes right down to it, I look at a battery and say, there's a box with two separate compartments. One side has a bunch of negatively charged electrons. The other side has a bunch of positive charges. The electrons want to get to that side and call it good. When you hook an electrical load like a motor or a light from one side of the battery to the other, the electrons have to travel through the load to get to the other side. Along the way, they impart energy to a load. It doesn't matter which model you use. The overcomplicated and time-consuming internal chemical reactions of the battery as a source of charge imbalance, or the quick and dirty mental image of a crowd of electrons plowing their way through an electrical load looking to hook up with a proton on the opposite side. The result is the same, moving electrons through a device. Which brings us to two basic electrical quantities I'd like to introduce, voltage and current. Voltage is why charges move. Voltage appears as a differential across something. Current is how many charges move in a given period of time. Current flows through something. The terms across and through don't mean the same things. Voltage and current are not the same thing, and they are not measured in the same way. Think about the terms across and through. Across means there are two points. Voltage is a measurement of the energy differential between two points. Through means there is one point. Current is a measurement of charge flow that passes through a single point. Across versus through, despite being non-technical terms, is the fundamental difference between voltage and current and speaks volumes about their nature and how to measure them. Let's use a simple model to illustrate across versus through and find similarities in our simple model between the basic electrical quantities of voltage, a differential across something, and current, a flow through something. Consider a box with two separate compartments. On the left side is a quantity of hot red water. Let's consider these characteristics positive. On the right side, there is an equal quantity of cold blue water. Let's consider these characteristics negative. There's a wall between them and there is a difference in temperature and color across them. You can measure the difference using a two-point measurement. It can be said that the left side is hotter and redder or more positive with reference to the right. Similarly, it can be said that the right side is colder and bluer or more negative with reference to the left. With reference to is an extremely important term to understand regarding voltage. With reference to means here is the point I am comparing all other points to. With reference to your lab partner, you are smart and good looking. This is the person you want as your wingman when you're out on the town. You're going to get a lot more action when a potential mate is faced with the prospects of going home with you or going home with someone that smells like the reptile house at the zoo. With reference to also means it's relative in nature. With reference to your lab partner, you are a total catch. With reference to me, I mean, come on, you look like one of those demented boss level characters from a bass fishing video game. Now let's talk about flow. With no passageway connecting the hot red side to the cold blue side, and given the wall between these two compartments is impermeable, no flow exists between the two sides. This being said, 
a difference still exists between the two sides. If one was to hook a pipe from one side of the container to the next, with a water wheel inside the passage, seeking equilibrium, hot red molecules of water would move this direction, and cold blue molecules of water would move the other, as both sides diffuse towards balance. As these molecules move, or flow, they do work by spinning the water wheel, which is resisting flow. If the water wheel wasn't there, we'd have an uncontrolled mixture, or uncontrolled flow. Given a controlled flow, we can measure the quantity of molecules that pass a single point in a given time period. This single point flow rate measurement is equivalent to current. Current is the flow, or the movement of a physical particle, namely the electron. In this model, I'm showing an equal and opposite movement of both red and blue particles, so you'd think they cancel each other out. But realize in an electrical system, only one thing is moving, the electron. So there is a net movement of charges in one direction. That's the problem with these simplifications. They're only good to a certain point. As the water molecules continue to flow from one side to the other, realize what is making them flow is one, the passageway between them, and two, most importantly, the difference in temperature and color between the two sides. This difference is equivalent to voltage, and it is the reason why charges move or flow. Voltage causes current. Realize that the differential in our closed system, if there is no other outside source striving to continually maintain the imbalance, is becoming less and less different over time as red hot water moves one way and cold blue water moves the other. When all the water in our closed system is neither hot nor cold nor red nor blue, but rather a uniformly warm, uniformly purple color, we can say there is no difference between the two terminals of our energy source, nor will there be any flow exchange between them. We have effectively discharged our battery, and our load grinds to a halt. Moving beyond this simple model, understand that voltage is the reason why charges move. Voltage is the cause. There is an imbalance or difference between two points. This difference is measured using the units of volts, often abbreviated with a capital V, where a volt in actuality is a derived unit that equals one joule of energy per coulomb of charge. A coulomb is a means of packing up charges into a more usable number, kind of like a dozen eggs actually means 12 eggs. Except a coulomb is a lot more than a dozen. It is a lot, lot, lot more. One coulomb equals 6.24 times 10 to the 18th charges. One can represent the concept of voltage in shorthand using a capital V. The movement of charges or current is the effect. The measurement of current must necessarily include a complete path for electrons to flow and must necessarily be a single point measurement somewhere in that path through which all moving electrons can be counted. Charge flow is measured in units of amps, often abbreviated with a capital A, where one amp in actuality is a derived unit that equals one coulomb of charges moving by a single point over a period of one second. You'll often see the concept of current represented in shorthand using a capital I, which stands for intensity. What limits, controls, or opposes current is our third basic electrical quantity, known as resistance. The unit of resistance is called the ohm, symbolized by this funny horseshoe looking thing. An ohm is also a derived unit where one ohm equals one volt over one amp. You'll often see the concept of resistance represented in shorthand using a capital R. On a very basic level, we can state that the effect induced in some system is equal to the cause over opposition. This should make sense. The more effort or cause given to a project or undertaking will undoubtedly yield more effects as long as opposition to your efforts remain low. If, however, opposition increases, the effects will be reduced. Given voltage is synonymous with cause, current synonymous with effect, and resistance synonymous with opposition, we can rewrite this relationship as current equals voltage over resistance. Looking closely at this relationship in either form, we can make the following statements. If opposition was held constant and cause increased, effects should also increase. Stated another way, same resistance, more voltage yields more current. Conversely, if opposition was held constant and cause decreased, effects should also decrease. Stated another way, same resistance, less voltage yields less current. Other observations are equally as valid. If cause was held constant and opposition increased, effects should decrease. Stated another way, same voltage, more resistance, yields less current. Conversely, if cause was held constant and opposition decreased, effects should increase. Stated another way, same voltage, 
less resistance yields more current. This extremely important cause, effect, and opposition relationship is known as Ohm's Law, which will be the most frequently used tool in your toolbox throughout the course of the entire basic, intermediate, advanced, and super advanced electronics series. I'll devote another entire lecture to DC Ohm's Law. In the meantime, just think in terms of cause, effect, and opposition. These terms and their relationship with one another should make sense on a very intuitive level. Let's now introduce the concept of power. As you are no doubt aware, power is energy over time and is measured using the units of watts, where one watt is equal to one joule of energy per second. Electrical power is also the product of voltage across something times the current through something. Power in units of watts equals voltage in units of volts times current in units of amps. Given one volt is a joule per coulomb and one amp is a coulomb per second, the units of coulombs cancel out and we're left with the units of joules per second or a unit of energy per unit of time or a unit of power where one joule per second is equivalent to a watt. Let's again use a simple model to illustrate power. Consider water under pressure hooked to a water wheel where a blocked valve does not permit movement of the water. If pressure equivalent to voltage exists but the water isn't flowing equivalent to zero current, the water wheel won't turn. High pressure times no flow yields no power. Consider another case where the water is flowing but exerting no force on the paddles of the water wheel. In this case, the water wheel still won't turn because the pressure or voltage is absent. High flow times no pressure yields no power. However, consider another application of this water wheel where both pressure and flow exist. The flowing water with a pressure differential exerts force on the paddle of the water wheel and because it's moving, turns it. Power is consumed from our fluid and delivered to our output shaft. Parallels between this water wheel analogy and an electrical system exist. Power is only delivered to or consumed by a system when there is both a voltage differential across and a current through something. We'll discuss power calculations in later lectures. For now, I'm hoping this basic introduction should suffice. Moving on, let's talk about schematics commonly used to illustrate electrical components and circuits. If I had to constantly draw accurate pictorial representations of batteries, resistors, and meters, and everything else inside the toy box, we'd be here all day. A far easier method is to use schematic symbols. This quick and dirty symbolic method is a common shorthand means of drawing electrical circuits. Schematics are like writing a foreign language. At first, it's going to seem weird and unwieldy but after a time, you'll get very adept at writing and reading schematics. Long story short, schematics save time, and once you learn how to read them, hint at the functionality and purpose of an electrical circuit. This is a schematic symbol for a battery or DC voltage source. DC stands for direct current and means that the direction of induced current doesn't change. Note that the schematic symbol for a DC voltage has long lines interspaced by short lines. What this is meant to represent is the plates of a traditional lead acid battery. The plus and minus markers on the DC voltage source are its polarity markers, meaning the longer terminal on the top with a plus on it has a higher voltage on it with reference to or compared to the shorter one on the bottom with a negative terminal. Again, voltage is a two-point measurement. It would also be just as easy and valid to say that the terminal with a negative on it has less voltage with reference to or compared to the positive terminal. A DC source would be in contrast to something like an AC source or an alternating current voltage source that switches the direction of induced current at regular or cyclical intervals. Let's just ignore AC for now. Electrical loads can take the form of resistors, capacitors, inductors, lights, buzzers, motors, and more. A majority of basic electrical properties can be illustrated using resistors. This is a symbol for a resistor which looks like a saw, a mountain range, or a speed bump. The purpose of a resistor is to resist or control current flow. A switch is an electromechanical device that makes or breaks connection to an electrical load. A single pole, single throw switch kind of looks like a little drawbridge. When the switch is open, the drawbridge is up and no current can pass through the switch. Conversely, when the switch is closed, the drawbridge is down and current can pass through the switch. Wires or conductive paths are illustrated using lines. If two or more wires connect at a single point, this connection is often illustrated with a dot. If two wires merely pass over one another but do not make an electrical connection, one does not employ a dot. Since this method illustrating a lack of connection can be easily mistaken for a connection during times of duress, 
It's actually a recommended practice to illustrate proximity but not connection using an overpass symbol, making it very clear and obvious that no connection exists. Using these basic schematic symbols, we can build a simple electrical circuit consisting of a conductive path from the positive terminal of a DC source to one terminal of a switch, from the other terminal of the switch to one terminal of a resistor, from the other terminal of the resistor back to the negative terminal of the DC source. When the switch is open, no current flows and the load is de-energized. When the switch is closed, current flows and the load is energized. Now that we've discussed basic electrical quantities and schematics in sufficiently nebulous terms, let's briefly discuss the meters used to commonly measure them. An ohm meter measures resistance, a voltmeter measures voltage, and an ammeter measures current. Carrying three separate meters that do three separate tasks will be kind of a pain, so quite like mixing a cobra, a beaver, and a duck together to make a platypus, you can combine all three of these meters together and more into something called a digital multimeter. Digital multimeters are often referred to as DMMs. This is your first slang term, and I'm encouraging you to use it often in the presence of your non-technically inclined friends and family, because it makes it sound like you're really smart, even if you know nothing beyond this abbreviation. A DMM is quite like a Swiss Army knife in that it can perform numerous functions. Also like a Swiss Army knife, it'd be confusing and unwieldy if we opened up every one of the saws, knives, axes, awls, scissors, and corkscrews all at the same time. It served us best if we opened up one tool at a time, looked at it, talked about it, and learned how to use it before we put it away and moved on to the next one. By discussing and learning how to use each function separately, my hopes are you can start compiling a checklist of do's and don'ts for each specific function. You can then compare and contrast the next tool we unveil with a function you already have a basic understanding of. We'll examine basic functions of DMMs in later lectures. For now, let's establish some basic general guidelines about all DMMs that we'll use throughout this lecture series. To properly employ a DMM, use the following checklist every single time. I am not recommending you use this checklist every time. I am demanding that you use this checklist every single time. The use of this checklist will save your measurement equipment and circuit a lot of costly downtime and may potentially save your life. I am not overstating the benefits of using this checklist. Use the checklist. Think about it. Really think about it. Take your time and think before you act. The checklist has four steps. Follow them one through four and you will get it right every single time. Skip a step, do a step wrong, or do a step out of order and you will get it wrong every single time. Function. Choose the quantity you wish to measure. Resistance, voltage, or current. DMMs use different detection mechanisms to measure different quantities, and if your DMM is in the wrong function, it won't work. Leads. Put your leads in the correct place. For voltmeter and ohmmeter mode, the leads go in one place. In an ammeter mode, they go in another. Of note, customarily, the red plug goes in a red hole, and the black plug goes in a black hole. You would be surprised how many people mess this up under stress. Range. If your DMM is not auto-ranging, one must manually choose an appropriate range to obtain the most accurate results. Whereas, if your DMM is auto-ranging, the DMM will automatically pick the most appropriate range to obtain the most accurate measurement results. Related to range, be aware there is a limited range a meter and you can safely measure. Most of the time it's written on the back of the meter or affixed to a sticker somewhere. Do not exceed this range or you will damage the meter and or yourself in the process of doing so. Certain levels require appropriate levels of PPE to measure them safely. Placement. This is the single most important step. One must put the DMM in the proper place to take the measurement of interest. Put it in any other place than the proper place, you won't be able to take the measurement you desire or you'll damage the meter, the circuit, or yourself. Ohmmeters measure the resistance of an element under test placed between the two leads in a units of ohms. Elements under test must not be energized and must be removed from a circuit to obtain a proper resistance measurement. Let's say this resistor, being measured by the ohmmeter, has a resistance of 6 ohms. Voltmeters measure the voltage differential across an element. A voltmeter has two connections, one identified with a positive lead and the other with a negative. The negative or common connection is the one that is employed as a reference. Any differential measured by the voltmeter would compare the positive lead to the reference. To measure the voltage differential across a DC voltage source, one would place the reference lead on the negative terminal of the source and the positive connection 
on the positive terminal of the source. If this is a 12 volt DC voltage source, this voltmeter would indicate that the positive terminal of the source is 12 volts higher than the negative terminal and display positive 12 volts. If, however, one placed the reference lead on the positive terminal and measure the negative with reference to the positive, the voltmeter would indicate the negative lead is 12 volts lower than the positive terminal and display negative 12 volts. The point being, regardless of voltmeter orientation, the magnitude of difference is the same, in both cases 12 volts, however only the reference position has been shifted. An ammeter also has two connections, one identified with an in and the other an out. Ammeters measure current through a circuit and must be placed in line or in series with the element through which they wish to measure current. Additionally, the circuit must have opposition or resistance to voltage for current to be controlled. Lacking opposition, current would be uncontrolled and you could possibly damage your ammeter. When the switch is open, the ammeter would read no current flow. When the switch is closed, current comes out of the source positive terminal, goes into the ammeter, comes out of the ammeter, goes into the closed switch, out of the closed switch, into the resistor, out of the resistor, and back to the negative terminal of the source. The point being, the ammeter is a single point through which all current must flow if it is to properly be measured. If one flip-flopped the orientation of the indoor and the outdoor of the ammeter, the ammeter would think 2 amps would be leaving it and would display negative 2 amps. Before we bring this lecture to a close, it needs to be stated that I am delivering the contents of this lecture series from an algebraic and a conventional current perspective. Algebraic means I am not using calculus. Calculus is a special type of math that explains rates of change in area using techniques called differentials and integrals. You don't necessarily need to use calculus to be an electrical technician, so I'm using a level of math, algebra, easily attainable by most people. I've done both methods before, and I actually prefer the algebraic means of teaching electricity and electronics. When time and occasion arise, I might hint at calculus in later lectures, especially when we get to AC, just to keep all the math nerds in the house entertained. However, for the most part, you can just pretend calculus doesn't exist and use the algebraic means I use to solve equations and understand electrical phenomena. Related to the diagram I just drew, conventional current means I'm using the established convention of current traveling from the assumed positive terminal of a source to the assumed negative terminal. Electrical phenomena are for the most part invisible and can only be observed and measured numerically on a meter. It is for this reason I'm willing to forgive Ben Franklin for a major error he made in 1752 that has been carried forward into our modern era. Ben Franklin chose a direction he thought electrons were traveling and that direction became the accepted convention, hence the term, for conventional current flow from that point forward. He thought electrons went from the positive terminal of a source to the negative terminal of a source. They didn't have Wikipedia back then, so no one could prove or disprove this assertion, and it wasn't until much, much, much later someone actually looked it up and found out he was wrong. Regardless, every meter made from 1752 forward reads current as it flows from positive to negative. Electrons, the moving negatively charged particles that flow through an electrical circuit, actually move from the negative terminal to the positive terminal. This being said, who really cares? If my ammeter reads 2 amps of conventional current going from positive to negative, and those 2 amps of current are being used to heat up a resistive coil inside a heating element to keep my house warm, do I care that 2 amps of electrons are actually flowing the other direction? It's still 2 amps. It's just that the accepted convention of flow is positive to negative, and that's the way your meter is going to read it, and that's how we are going to talk about it for the remainder of the basic electronics series, because that's the convention, meaning it is the accepted standard. Realize it would not be a standard if there weren't organization or textbooks or individuals that refuse to accept this standard and try to do it their own way. Look at Quebec. If Canada says forward, Quebec says backward in a different language just to be a jerk. You might enroll in the Navy NEATS program or pick up a textbook that uses electron flow theory, the opposite of conventional current flow theory, and be all like, the fuck are they talking about? My advice is relax. Electron flow theory is technically correct. It's just that no one uses it and everyone uses the accepted convention that current flows from the positive terminal of a voltage source to the negative terminal of a voltage source. Even if you hook up an ammeter backwards and conventional current is going in the outdoor and out the indoor, the magnitude of the current will be the same. The accepted polarity or sign indicated by an ammeter or a voltmeter is always with reference to conventional current. 
In closing, I need to remind you that the simple models I use during the course of this introductory discussion, especially the water analogies, have their limitations. And the last thing I want you to do is cut a live electrical wire and expect to see a pool of cool blue electrons forming at your feet. These were illustrations only, and I'm urging you to move beyond these analogies as we move deeper and deeper into our discussions of basic electricity. Electricity is its own weird, many-tentacled monster, and it must be treated as such. That being said, these simple models seem to work quite well for those new to the subject. All right, that's about it. Despite the fact that I tried to avoid getting obsessively deep technical detail, there's a lot of content in here. I recommend hitting this lecture up a couple times if you're still a little shaky. Draw pictures, take notes, and for your own sake, don't leave without at least a general understanding of the basic electrical quantities of voltage, current, resistance, and power. Voltage is a differential across two points. Current is flow through a single point. Resistance is opposition to current flow. Delivery of power necessitates both voltage and current. In conclusion, this lecture presented the basic electrical quantities of voltage, current, resistance, and power on an extremely introductory level. We discussed the units to measure these quantities, common instrumentation used to measure these basic quantities, and the means of calculating these quantities. Remember to review this material as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your lazy lab partner about this resource. Be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.